Thank you, Joey. Big week here on That's What G Said. It is Belmont week. So, you know what that means. We'll have a couple podcasts coming out, talking all about the Belmont races on Friday. Just a few of the Friday races I'll hit up on this show, and then I'll have another show that comes out. We'll go through the entire Saturday. Probably have races one through, I guess there's 13. We might even hit all 13 or maybe 12 of the 13. We'll see. We'll do the deep dives in the uh, the racing, like always. Hope everyone has had a nice week. Took a, took a few days off. Just one show last week, but we'll come back firing with a, with a couple, maybe three shows this week. What's on the menu for today on That's What G Said? Do a little WWE Super Showdown preview. There's a show on Friday afternoon from Saudi Arabia. We'll kind of just talk a little bit about it overall. NBA Finals predictions, horse racing movies, and we'll talk about what happened in, in the best basketball movie. So as, if you've noticed, each week now will be a different themed sport and we're going to do the best movies for each one of those so I'm going to need a lot of your help out there when it comes to some of the sports that I'm not as you know I'm not as big a fan of I don't know as well um, so I probably don't know the movies quite as well but the the short list right now so we've done basketball movies this week currently doing horse racing movies hockey, soccer, baseball football, boxing, golf I figure all could have their own weeks with probably 16 to 32 for each of those sports. I think baseball, we might even have to have like a full-on 64 bracket because there are a ton of like quality baseball movies out there. And then maybe for like track and field, figure skating, we'll do some kind of other other Olympics, some something like that. We'll, We'll continue. So if you have any ideas or thoughts on that, shoot them in. And then afterwards... We'll do a final full-on best sports movie where we take the best, the winner from each of the sports, and we will have them face off against each other. The way we the way I do it is put everybody up in polls on Twitter. So if you're not following me on Twitter, go to it's me Gino B on Twitter, follow, and you'll notice I'll always put up the polls. So right now we had the round of 32 polls up for horse racing. They finished off at the end of the day. Put up now the round of 16. And then tomorrow will be the round of eight and so on and so forth. So be sure to get to uh, It's Me, Gino B. Also right now, stop if you can. Before you do anything else, if you can get over to iTunes and subscribe to That's What G Said and then leave a nice little five-star rating and a comment. Just a little comment, a review, something that you like about the show, something that um, whatever subject that you like, are you tuning in for You know, Lakers talk, Dodgers talk, horse racing picks, you want movies, um, WWE, whatever you like about the show, would love if you can if you can get a five star. That's honestly like paying us a few bucks. Really, is those, those things go a long way. And if you can do that, that would be awesome. And that's I'll, I won't charge you anything for all the amazing horse racing analysis you're going to get over these next. The only thing I will ask you is if you can give me a payment of a nice little five star rating and review over the weekend. It was a, a fight that wasn't really supposed to be a big fight in the boxing world. It was a heavyweight fight, and it was Anthony Joshua. And Anthony Joshua, 22-0, and 0, four heavyweight championship belts. In the heavyweight boxing division right now, there are three. It's Anthony Joshua, three big kind of stars, and we just we haven't seen them fight. Much, which is really frustrating. It's Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, and then Fury. And we've seen Wilder and Fury fight, but we haven't seen any either of them hook up with Joshua. And Joshua had another fight scheduled. That fighter had to be had to drop out because he he had tested positive for a banned substance. So Andy Ruiz Jr., who had just fought on April the twentieth, he comes back and fights. And let's be honest about Andy Ruiz. When you look at him, he's a big, chubby guy. He is not in in shape. He looks out of shape. You kind of figure, oh, this guy can't be much. His hands are so quick. They're so amazingly quick. And the thought had been that, you know, Anthony Joshua had been dodging Wilder and Fury for the big fights. Now, Joshua is a draw. He is a draw. He is from the UK and... 
massive people tune in and come out to his fights and so there will be a big rematch now but Ruiz wasn't just a slouch he's 33 and 1 with 22 knockouts now we'll have the rematch Ruiz Joshua Wilder versus Luis Ortiz is set up for September and then Tyson Fury for versus Tom Schwartz is on June the 15th so we'll see these the big 3 and maybe now the big 4 with with Ruiz fight but not really against each other and, and maybe this is this means we'll be more likely to get a Joshua Wilder Fury combinations because Joshua isn't as what, what, would, what was Rocky uh, what was Mick saying they was bums rock they was bums same thing I think I said a couple weeks ago about uh, about Deontay Wilder you know so hopefully we can see the big names in boxing all off uh, hook up and all, all face off a shout out to my cousin Nate graduated from kindergarten he was over at Monroe Elementary shout out to Nate went to his little ceremony on uh, he was wearing his nice jacket looks sharp Nate nice job buddy graduated kindergarten on to grade number one current shows that I'm watching if you're not watching billions I won't give you any I won't spoil it at all it is an excellent show it is in season four right now and I believe the season finale is coming up this weekend for season four really really good all about money, really. The the big investors, the big um, hedge funds, all throughout New York. Really good stuff, and it's very well written. The people who uh, wrote ra- uh, Rounders, and there's a lot of like, f- it's it's a dramedy in that it's a dramatic show, but there's a lot of comedy to it, and it's very funny and it's very real. There's a lot of Pop culture references, they reference wrestling and sports all the time. Really good stuff. If you've never watched Billions, check it out. Worth your time. Let me get you into a couple other shows. Staying with the, um, with the show, with the TV shows, let's go to All American. If you've never seen All American, it's on Netflix. Check it out. Very comparable to Friday Night Lights. High school football player has to change teams. Um, it's about Spencer James. It's actually based on a, a true story. And if you like Friday Night Lights, if you like like you know the high school dramas or just a sports show in general, very, very good. Check out All American. I think the CW, and I, I picked it up on Netflix just recently, so I'm almost finishing up with it. Really like the show. The one, the one kid is in Crenshaw. He's a very good football player, but he plays in a tough neighborhood. And... The coach from Beverly Hills wants to try to rec- uh, recruit him, basically to come over and play, and, and kind of gets him out of trouble, takes him out of the out of the hood. Really like it, All American. Then a couple movies on Netflix that I recently checked out. The Last Summer. If you like rom coms, these two movies are really for you. The Last Summer is. It's right when all these kids graduate from high school and right before they go to college and all their, they're they're going to do that summer before they all go their separate ways and so many stereotypes and just – it's very corny but it's entertaining. I love these kind of movies. If these are your type, check out The Last Summer on Netflix. It is starring uh, KJ Apa, Archie from uh, from Riverdale. If you like Riverdale, he he's a very good actor. He's a good, good-looking kid too. Does a good job, and and then the last one is always be my baby. It's another rom com on Netflix, and it is with Ali Wong and Randall Park. Great, really funny, same type of thing, just corny, but it it knows what it is, and it it really leans into it. And wow, Keanu Reeves has such a funny cameo. In this movie, I don't want to spoil anything for you, but another just worth worth you know an hour and a half. I think it's great, funny, funny stuff. Always be my baby, corny, but if you, this is my type, I like I like this kind of thing. It's it's worth it. And and tell me you don't think the Keanu Reeves role and then the Keanu Reeves song are excellent. On this day, June the fourth, when recording 
when recording this. It's going to be June the 5th when most of you listen to this and maybe even after, but June the 4th when when recording. On many June the 4th throughout history, you go back and look and you see many different editions of the Belmont, which we obviously have coming up this weekend. Back in 1927, it was the first Ryder Cup. And in that first Ryder Cup, the U.S. beat Great Britain. Some familiar names. Walter Hagen. Ted Ray reminds me of the Shia LaBeouf movie, The Greatest Game Ever Played. 1964, Sandy Koufax, third no-hitter, beat the Phillies 3-0. 1984, Arnold Palmer fails to make the U.S. Open for the first time in 32 years. 1990, Ramon Martinez strikes out 18. 2008, the Red Wings, they win their 11th Stanley Cup. I'm kind of bouncing all over the place here. 1984, Bruce Springsteen releases Born in the USA. 2002, Avril Lavigne releases the album Let It Go. 1968, Don Drysdale pitches a sixth straight shutout. Wow. Let's go back in time a little bit. 781 BC, the oldest Chinese recording of a solar eclipse on June the 4th. 1039, Henry the Third becomes the Holy Roman Emperor. We go from one Henry to the next. In 1896, Henry Ford takes his first Ford through the streets of Detroit. 1912, Massachusetts passes its first U.S. minimum wage law. 1975, the oldest animal fossils in the U.S. discovered in North Carolina. On this day. little WWE talk. It's a lull right now in WWE. The storylines aren't great. There's a show coming up on Friday. It's actually in the in the day. It's broadcast from Saudi Arabia. And that's the first question. If you're a wrestling fan, and are, are you bothered by the fact that WWE does business with Saudi Arabia and they do shows like this that don't allow their women to compete on the show? It's, it's tough for me because so many businesses deal with Companies that are, you know, not on the up and up all the time. There's been a lot of bad things happening in Saudi Arabia. You know, the country's trying to turn around, but it's a, it's a little strange. Apparently, these deals are huge for WWE, so much so that they make more money than WWE makes dur- in WrestleMania. And you'll notice because WWE will pull out all the stops. They pay all the big stars to come back. Now, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes you get. It's fun to see some of the old stars, and then other times you have Shawn Michaels and you know Triple H and The Undertaker and Kane wrestling in a match that just isn't very good, and you don't really want to see that at the end of their careers. The Friday card is at 2 o'clock Eastern, 11 o'clock Pacific time. I think there's a pre-show before that called Super Showdown. They're actually going to have a 50-man battle royal. So anytime there's a big battle royal like that, I'm always turning tuning in for curiosity's sake. I love to see. I'm just a big Sucker for a, a Royal Rumble or a Battle Royal, even if they're just meaningless like this. You'll have Braun Strowman versus Bobby Lashley. Uh, saw the arm wrestling thing earlier this week. Roman Reigns versus Shane McMahon. That match has been built up okay. Shane's annoying and he's doing a good job of pissing you off and bothering you as a heel. So, you know, that that's great. I just can't imagine... Roman getting beat here, but it, it's not bad for Roman. It gives him something to do right now to kind of keep him away from the title. Finn Balor versus Andrade, like we're going to see the Demon. We just haven't seen Finn really at all, and this match has not been getting a very good build for this. Kofi versus Ziggler for the title. Ziggler's back. He's complaining that Kofi basically stole the spot that Ziggler should be in. It's kind of funny. Yeah, Ziggler very well could have been a guy like Ziggler who Never really got his opportunity. Never really got a big opportunity, but he he's been a former world champion. Seth Rollins, Baron Corbin, and now Brock Lesnar says he's cashing the money in the bank in after beating Seth Rollins down on Monday Night Raw. Will he cash in in this match? What happens? Does he cash in after the match? During? Before? We're gonna get Triple H versus Randy Orton. These two have a long history together. Not 
anything special. I'm, I'm sure it'll just be you know that long Triple H type 25 minute match that he always has. And then the Undertaker versus Goldberg. This will be interesting just for the entrances alone, right? Goldberg entrance from the backstage, and then the Undertaker making that 20 minute slow walk to the ring. First time they've ever fought. Taker says he wants the old badass who's next to Goldberg, not Family Man Goldberg. And Goldberg said that's what he's going to give him. So, on paper, you're looking at the card, and it's not bad, right? So, I'm always going to tune in to things like this, see how it goes. If you have not been paying attention to Bray Wyatt and the Firefly Funhouse, just type in Firefly Fun Firefly Funhouse on YouTube or Twitter or whatever, and, and look at the videos. Some people like these, some hate them. I love them. They're just different. They're they're a little wild. Now, hopefully, they can keep this up and be consistent with them. But this last week's video was like an '80s workout, Richard Simmons kind of thing with Zubaz pants. I mean, it was just out there and wild. What's going to happen when Bray has to wrestle though We haven't seen a wrestle in a while And they're they're not just doing these backstage pre-recorded You know Obviously skits that they put a lot of time and energy into How will that translate into the ring? And then a couple interviews to check out if you haven't Dean Ambrose who left WWE Now wrestling as John Moxley He spoke about WWE in a couple interviews One with Chris Jericho And then another with Wade Keller And both these interviews are great Because he's very honest He talks about backstage at WWE The storylines You know, his promos Why certain things happen Us fans, we complain about a lot of things But we don't know the story at all backstage And he talked about the process And very interesting And he he didn't come off bitter at all You know, I as That was a Something when I left TVG, I didn't want to come off ever bitter talking about you know things that you like or you didn't like or you know some of the reasons why. So it, you you just want to be honest and and let people know without without coming off bitter. And I thought he did a very good job of just you know this is this is one of the things I like. This is something I didn't like. And very very interesting and wor- interviews I think that are worth your time. Check out the uh, the the Moxley. Interviews there Some NBA thoughts real quick On games 1 and 2 Series is tied 1-1 Toronto wins game 1 And we'll think about that as the game that Pascal Siakam had had the huge game 32 points, 8 rebounds, 5 assists 2 blocks and a steal And Gasol, Marc Gasol had 20 points and 7 rebounds And we've seen Fred Van Fleet Become very consistent, he had 15 But you're getting 52 from Siakam and Gasol It really doesn't even matter what Kawhi Or Lowry do after that Right In game 2 It really was a, a lot more About DeMarcus Cousins 11 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists and 2 blocks And he played a big role Because Clay got hurt late in the game Clay had 25 points before getting hurt 25 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists and a steal And then Draymond has just been Amazing, right now if Golden State wins, you'd have to say that, you know, based on what we've seen, I think Draymond wins the MVP. Clay is going to have a big game or two, so he, or Steph's going to have a big game or two, so he still has a big shot. But I think it's Draymond right now, based on what we've seen. Iguodala just giving you big minutes, you know, eight points, eight rebounds, six assists, playing good defense, making big shots. As a team, Golden State in game two shot 30, um, 13 for 34 from three, 38%. Kawhi had 34 points. But he had to work a little bit, right? He was 8 for 20, and he shot 16 free throws. 16 for 16 from the free throw line. 14 rebounds and 3 assists. But you compare that Game 1 from Siakam and Gasol. 52 points. Game 2, they only had 18 points total together. Lowry was a minus 17 plus minus. He was someone that I had predicted before the series would be key, and maybe he could be like a long shot to play as MVP because... If they win, you're going to need big games from him, and he, they haven't really gotten from Lowry yet. He was a the minus seventeen. Van, uh, Van Fleet is out playing him. Van Fleet, Van Fleet played 38 minutes with 17 points, four rebounds, three steals, and two assists. What we saw in game two is that even with just an okay game from Steph, and we say okay, 23 points, four assists, and three rebounds, he was six of 17 overall and just three for 10 from three. Just an okay game from him. Clay leaving early. So that Clay played probably 10, 12 minutes less than he would have played. And no Durant. Cousins just coming back. A banged up Iguodala. Looney left and he's out. They're still able to win on the road. This team is so deep. 
They are so deep. They have so many weapons. Now we know that Kayvon Looney's out for the rest of the finals with a right upper body fracture. Clay Thompson with a hamstring strain, questionable for game three. Clay has never missed a playoff game, and Clay's only missed 25 games over the last seven years combined. So, Clay is not one that you expect to be missing games or to be missing big playoff games like this. Who knows? From everything that I heard. The team kind of wants to keep him out, and Clay really is trying to play. I'm still predicting Golden State. I think I said six. That still feels right. I, I think they're going to win two. Maybe they go, Toronto goes back and win one, and I, I still it still feels like six to me. Golden State in six. Last week we did the basketball movies, the best basketball movies, and the winners. Thank you to everyone who voted. Remember, get to Twitter at it's me Gino B to go vote for best basketball movies. Hoosiers over white men can't jump in the final. It started out with 32 down to two Hoosiers, 55%. White man can't jump 45%. So that was a a pretty close vote in the final. And next week, I'm really going to need your help because we're going to talk hockey movies next week. And hockey is not a sport that I know all that well. So hockey movies, we're going to talk best hockey movies. I want to know... Give me your best hockey movies, favorite hockey movies, popular ones, obscure ones. We'll need to make a list. We'll have to see if we can get to 32. If not, we'll just get to 16 or eight. Any of those, um, any of those nice uh, round numbers, and, and even something in between. We can do some groups of three and four voting. I'll put all the polls on Twitter. It's me, Gino B. Get over to uh, to vote. Because right now, we have the horse racing movies, the best horse racing movies. There were 32. Lots of great feedback. On the horse racing movies. And let's tell you what the matchups were in 32. The number one seed. Let it ride. Was against home in Indiana. Racing Stripes was the 16. Lean on Pete was the 17. Racing Stripes won that one. Hot to Trot and Chasing the Win. Hot to Trot won that matchup. Ruffian, the 8 seed, beat Kentucky. So Ruffian moving on to the Sweet 16. Casey Shadow beat Pride of the Bluegrass. Dreamer beat Riding High. A Day at the Races beat the Black Stallion. And Dark Horse with a big upset over Boots Malone, which I had Boots Malone as the number four seed. I love that. I had a lot of people telling me about Boots Malone. When I watched it for the first time, you can see that movie on YouTube for free. Go go type it in. It is a good movie. I'm really surprised and a little bummed out. Boots Malone is not moving on. In the other side of the bracket, Secretariat beats the Derby Stallion. Champions beats The Killing. The Long Shot beats Ready to Run, the Disney movie. Thanks for that one, Andrew Champagne. April Love with an upset. April Love loses to Hidalgo. So Hidalgo beats April Love. Far Lap over Thoroughbreds. Don't cry. National Velvet gets beat. That was another one of the big upsets in here. First Saturday in May, which is very good. But National Velvet was one of the more well-known kind of horse racing, you know, involving horse movies out there. And on the mainstream. And 50 to 1, and they're off. 50 to 1 won that matchup. And then Seabiscuit beat the great Dan Patch. So down to 16. Get on over to Twitter to vote on the polls for the Sweet 16. I had never seen Boots Malone. Really recommend checking that one out on YouTube. If you've never seen The Long Shot, I have never seen it all the way through. I've probably seen bits and pieces of The Long Shot 10, 15 different times. So, so great. A lot of it at Hollywood Park. Tim Conway, who unfortunately just passed away recently. The so many great like racetrack superstitions or different things. The lucky toilet. They all put together a bet in the group, and the one guy changes the bet last minute because the guy in front of him at the windows is betting a different horse and he follows him. The tips, the the cooking in the car scene. If they had a contest for losers, the four of us would be tied for first place. It is great. Another one that's on YouTube. You can go check out The Long Shot. Really good. Most of these movies are all either on, on Amazon Prime, but a few of them are on YouTube for free. And, and so you could really enjoy that. Ruffians, another one on YouTube for free. Uh, Secretary, it's on Netflix. It's very solid. You know, the Disney movie. A very good cast. I would expect... That the final 
three would be Let It Ride and then whoever wins between Secretary and Seabiscuit. I'm kind of curious who's going to be the, on the other side of the bracket. Now, maybe Casey Shadow. That's a good one, too, that I uh, I just recently watched. Check that one out with Walter Matthau. Very, very good quarter horse movie. Casey Shadow. So, we'll be to eight tomorrow, and then down to four, and then down to two. So, follow along on Twitter so you can find out the best horse racing movies. Uh, just some quick some quick thoughts. Let it ride, obviously. Huge racing stripes. Um, goofy. Hot. Lean on Pete is a if you haven't seen Lean on Pete, Jason Beam, uh, you hear Jason Beam's voice in there calling the races, some of the races, and it is. I I enjoyed the movie. It's intense. It's not easy to watch. It's, but it's a, it's an eye opener. I, I I thought it was it was a, a well done movie. Ruffian, Trot, Casey Shadow, real good. Dreamer, most of you know that one. A Day at the Races, Marx Brothers, Dark Horse. That was a, a more recent movie you can check out. Secretary, it's going to be tough. Champions, that was uh, one that Walk was on uh, Joaquin's mention. Champions did a lot of good feedback, too. I like Champions quite a bit. The Long Shot, Hidalgo, one of the more mainstream recent movies, Hidalgo. Far Lap, first Saturday in May, 50 to 1, and then Seabiscuit. So, who do you think is going to win? I'd say, I mean, Let It Ride feels like it. Let it. I wouldn't be shocked, though, if, if Secretary or Seabiscuit beat Let It Ride. When they were in the final matchup, but just everyone is just let it ride, let it ride, let it ride. That that is, I feel like, is going to just storm its way into the finals. Belmont Park Friday, the Friday card. We're just gonna go through some of the races. I, I to be fair, there are really good horses running on Friday and Saturday at Belmont. I don't right now feel like I found as many like really good price horses that I liked. So let's uh. Let's head on through. Remember, folks, if you can, the payment that I ask, just head on over to iTunes, leave a little nice five-star rating and review. Also, you can listen to That's What GTEP, G uh, I don't even know the name of my own show. That's What G said on YouTube. Subscribe there. SoundCloud is where I usually uh, post the shows immediately because that's right where I record them and then they get posted to all the other sites afterwards. Spreaker on there, TuneIn Radio, all over the place. Let's go to Belmont on Friday. Get your past performances out. Fifth race. Fifth race on Friday. It's the bed of roses. Seven furlongs, fillies and mares. Let's start from the rail with Seguro Row. He is looking for, or she's looking for her third race in a row. It's her third start off the bench. She's grown up nicely at the age of four on April the 11th. She wanted to go early, but she was in between. She was towards the back of the pack. And once she was asked, she angled out four deep. And she was handled very confidently to get up for the win at Keeneland. On May the 12th, it was a slow start in the slop. She moved up nicely on the outside. Three deep was in hand. Had to work a bit early in the stretch, but put that rival away and kicked on. Defeated a rival who just came back to win an optional 62 next out. The third place finisher. No real knocks on Seguro Row, except that it's not going to be easy from the from the rail with her running style. I think she's going to have to drop back, come around, make one r- late run, and she's stepping up in class and facing graded stakes company in a tougher group. The two, my big Italian friend. Hey, there we go. Love the Itals. Let's go back to February the 8th. Two starts back. She broke well. She battled in between for the lead. She was within a group of three. And I put them all away and had no real challenges late. Then on March the 28th, wasn't a smooth start, was in tight, a little bit of traffic, was back to fifth of six, chasing lone speed, and she was the only one who really closed on an off track at Gulfstream, a speed favoring racetrack, and chasing a lone front runner. I think she's got a big, big shot in here. And she's going to be really the 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 horse I play and the key to this race for me. Her numbers and figures are just a tad low, but there's not a lot if you there's really no front runner in here. And I think the two, my big Italian friend, if they want, have the opportunity to be right on the lead or close to it. So I hope they get aggressive. I hope Irad Ortiz Jr. sends hard. 
And my big Italian friend has a big, big shot in here. To me, I have I think the two and the three are the are really the the way that I'm going to play this race. Two, three exactas. I'll play if if my big Italian friend is over eight to one, I think we'll play a little win money on this one. Exactas with two, three, and then two, three over, and really anything else you want to play, two, three and all the exotics. Because I don't think Shalone is a play against at all. I think she's a very, very nice mare. She is improving. She's getting better and better as she continues to get older now. And we don't see this a lot with horses. They get better, they improve, and then they're done. And I, it's always nice to see a quality animal who had a good year, started to get really good at the end of the year, and now she's back and she's you know, bigger and better than ever. Shalone making just her second start back. Now the only concern is she's coming back in just three weeks, she's been a little bit better with to- with time, and she's been a little bit better going a little shorter. But that's when you get older and you mature, you're getting a little bit better. And she's been more, she's been a fill a mare now who relaxes a, l- a lot more. You notice early on in her, in her career, she was very speedy and one dimensional, and she couldn't sit. And now she's the opposite. She has great positional speed. And they just put her, you know, right within stalking range, and she's always traveling well. She just missed in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint. And that was a wicked beat. She ran well at Belmont early on in her career. She's a four-time stakes winner overall. She's a five-time graded stakes placed. What's funny is she's actually looking for her first ever graded stakes win. She has one win at six and a half furlongs. She's never won at seven furlongs. And five of her wins have come at six. So she's growing up. She's not facing the toughest group in the world. This is an excellent spot for her to try and get her first graded stakes win and her first win over six and a half furlongs. You have to try because a lot of these races are at, you know, six and a half, seven. You can't just skip all of those races. And as she's maturing, getting older, this is a great opportunity for her to take a for her to take a swing and for her to hopefully make this next step in her career. She's a very nice animal and a nice mare and one of the better uh, in the Philly and Mare Sprint Division. Pacific Gale. If you go back, she's 0 for her last six, but she's faced some nice ones. She hooked Come Dancing, who we're going to see in grade one on Saturday, in a couple of different starts. She hooked America's Tail, who's 6 for 18 and has earned $400,000. She hooked Dream Pauline, Multiple times, who's four for five. That's a multiple graded stakes winner. And if you go back to January the 26th, when she was behind Dream Pauline, Stormy Embrace was third. That's a grade two winner who's earned $550,000. The fourth place finisher that day was Shamrock Rose, who won the Breeders' Cup. And the fifth place finisher is Blamed, who's a multiple graded stakes winner. That was a loaded race. So Pacific Gale has been coming out of some very nice races just defeated a neck last time out. She broke fine from the rail, but she got shuffled a bit. She waited for an opening. She moved through. That shuffle might have cost her winning as she was only beaten a neck. She did defeat Separation of Powers, who she faces in this race. She did defeat Don the Destroyer, who she also faces in this race. So has an advantage over a couple of these common rivals. I have Pacific Gale picked third in here. I have this race 3-2-4. Let's go to Don the Destroyer. Who was last of five early on was five or six off and just never got involved when, when finishing fourth. I didn't need to see a lot more from this mare. I do think at seven furlongs she will be a little bit better than at six and a half furlongs, but not as big a fan of her as I am of a, a couple of the others in here. Spring in the wind is the six, and she. Races for Pellucci, who is the owner of Heaven Has My Nikki, and you see Heaven Has My Nikki defeated a couple of these in the vagrancy, so he probably has a good idea of you know what quality an animal would it take to beat some of these. Last out, she tried tough, and she broke. She tried the Humana Distaff. She broke slow from the inside. She was last. She was seven, eight out of it. She just kind of beat a horse who was eased. But that was a much tougher spot. I don't think this race is is tougher than that race was. Just from a depth standpoint, maybe the very top of this race with, with Shalone. Underneath, still not sure if she's good enough to win, but 
wouldn't completely dismiss this one. I was a, really disappointed with Separation of Powers' last couple races. She was really good at two, right? She's a multiple grade one winner. She won a grade one at two. She won a grade one at three. Has she improved now at the age of four? She's making her second start. She should take a nice step forward. It's only her second start since September. She was just really flat in a race where she was a step slow. She moved up to press from second. And she was in the two pass. So even after the step slow, she's in a great spot. She's just outside. She just has nothing. And she backed up. So a little disappointing. Can she take a big step forward? Absolutely. I don't want to bank on it at a short price. So I'm I'm much more willing to take a shot with the two as the price in here and the three as the horse that you, you use in all your exotics. So let's hook those two up in all exotics. A few bucks to win on the two if we can get like over eight to one. But don't dismiss Shalone in any of your multi-race exotics. Won't give you a pick. Five or pick four, anything rolling on Friday. I'll give you some, um, couple like a pick four and a pick five to play on Saturday. But on Friday, we're just going to go race by race because we're only going to play out you know, about four or five of these races. So that's the fifth. Let's move on to race number. Just a, a quick thought on the sixth. I'm, I'm not even going to handicap this race. It's a it's a difficult race because there are a lot of variables in this race. Right, you have a great stakes place, awesome Saturday from the inside. You have Noble Indy, who's never tried the turf, but this was a Louisiana Derby winner who won three of his first door starts, and since then he's zero for six. He hasn't hit the board, and he hasn't really been close. Multipliers a great three Illinois Derby winner for an allowance is just a fun group. G Dew's a multiple stakes winner who's great at stakes place. He's actually co-entered. He'll be uh, or cross-entered. He's cross-entered in the race on Saturday. You have. Big Handsome, who has some graded stakes experience. You have a horse like Have At It, who's a grade two winner. And then, you know, Annals of Time. What do you do with Annals of Time, who we have not seen since September of 2017? But he's lightly raced. He's a six-year-old who's only raced five times, but a grade one winner, and he's done almost nothing wrong in his career. Just a a race that has a lot of a lot of like head-scratching horses to look at. And I didn't I just wanted to steer clear of that race because couldn't really get a feel for it the more I was I was really sinking my teeth into it. Let's move to race number seven, the Tremont. The two Mavens going to be scratched, so the two will not be running in this race. That's going to change the race quite a bit because that was obviously your 7-5 favorite and a horse who was going to take a lot of the action. Let's start with a, another Italian, huh? The Italian-American. So we have the top selection in race number five. My big Italian friend. And now we have the Italian American who I'm, I'm going to put second in here. I, I'm, I'm going to use three horses really. So I think of those three, no, I, I won't be like chucking any of those three out. A lot of it will depend on, on price. He's a New York bred. He was outrun a little bit early, the Italian American, in his debut. He was double digit lengths behind and he was last of all. He was. No, sixth at the top of the lane, dead last. He moves up the rail and he absolutely flew and he just missed winning with a big, big gallop out. Now, he draws the rail. Not going to be easy for a Stone Cold closer. So he's going to have to drop back and make a late run and make a rally. But there, you know, you'd expect at least two or three of these horses to be pushing the pace and, and having a quick early pace. And some of these horses who are ready to go early on, you know, have their one speed and then they, that's it. They drop back. And so should have every opportunity to pass some tired horses late and to get into the mix. The Italian American scratch the two Maven, the three now is blinkers on debuted on the grass. Four of five siblings tried the dirt and have won on the grass. The blinker uh, now the blinkers come on. It was a fine third on the grass, and I don't really have much more to say. Johnny V jumps aboard. Would I be shocked to see him win? No, but it's it's just tough to use him when a couple of these others have ran run a little bit better on the dirt. Like four left, the four who is for Doug O'Neill. Red and Racing and Mario Gutierrez. We know these connections. In his debut, this two-year-old 
son of Twirling Candy, broke very fast. He opened up a length immediately, and he held off a very solid Phantom Boss, who is a next out winner. The third place finisher was also a next out winner. So that race has come back very live so far. So four left was only a neck winner, but he defeated a couple next out winners so far. So I think he's a major, major player and obvious top contender, probably the one to beat in here. Federale is the five. Debuted at Delaware. Wasn't bad at all. And if you're looking for just a bust out long shot in this race, I would steer you here. I don't know if I'll be able to use him in anything other than underneath spots, like if you're playing multi-race exotics or on the win end, but let's see what price he ends up going off at. He was three wide, he was battling early, he then ends up in between, and he's in tight, he drops back, he angles out in between, and he comes on again. Thought it was a pretty good effort first time out, kind of showed some multiple gears, kept trying, kept coming on again. Maybe the bust out long shot in the race. Federale. Dixie Moe. The six. She secured a nice spot. And I do say she. So she is facing the boys in here. She secured a nice spot from the outside. She was third of four. She was always traveling well. She always looked like a winner. That was at Indy. That was in a race that was taken off the grass. Now she's facing boys and a group of stakes. Boys for Wesley Ward. But, you know, the other Wesley Ward is likely going to be scratched out of here. Still like like others more. Would not be a shock. The The odds in this race are going to be all way off now with that, that big scratch. So whatever the morning line is, don't really pay attention to that in this particular race. Because with, with the scratch of Maven, everything's going to be cattywampus. Memorable. He was quick. He was in front right away. He... Pressed and, and then he, he took back a little bit. He pressed just off. He moved to the lead when asked. It was a good, strong win. Asmussen's had a little bit of a slow start to the Belmont meet, but Santana's aboard for Asmussen. Speedy contender in here. Probably have to deal with the, some other pace pressure, but top tier contender. My top selection is the eight rookie Salsa. He's the only horse in here that's raced multiple times. He's actually already a stakes winner. He's a lone multiple winner, two for two. His debut on April the 19th. He was bumped a bit, but he was never far out of it. He pressed, he just sat off, he was just off the leader pressing. He moved up to take the lead at the top of the lane. And it wasn't like he just moved up and took the lead and then that was it. He won a stretch battle. After it, it was good So he has to move up Gets the lead And then he has to win a battle Throughout the stretch Then last out He breaks well He's Mid pack In between horses Stays to the inside Then he angles out Quickly Mid stretch It was very nice Kind of behind horses Angles out Around Seems like a very Push button Horse And I think He will be Very Very Tough in this race Especially With the the likely scratch with, with the scratch of Maven now. So rookies also with the outside draw going to be my top selection. I have this race eight one four and then Faderale uh, five. If you were looking for like bottom of exotics or maybe just a, a real big price to play in here. So yeah, eight one and four. This is the way the race looks on paper, right? I think rookie salsa gets the trip, sitting just off. If four left can get the lead and no one else goes. It, it, or no one else is quick enough, or he's able to just maybe better than the rest of them. I don't want to completely throw him out. And I think if they go too quick early on, the one that benefits is the Italian American. Even with that rail draw, he still has the opportunity to take back and make one big run. And you got to remember, horses like this too, it's because he was really outrun early. We don't know that he didn't have a little bit more tactical speed, that he can't get involved in at least be mid pack or. A little bit closer, so so tough when they've just run one time to say, yeah, that's for sure going to be what his running style is next time out. Eight, one, four, five there with rookie salsa. I mean, if rookie salsa is over five to two, that should be a a, a nice win wager, I think, on rookie salsa. And maybe, um, no, well, maybe you can put him on top in some spots as. 
you know, it's rookie Salsa and four left are likely, I think, gonna gonna vie for favoritism. I do expect Memorable to get bet down a little bit more too now with that scratch. Seventh race at Belmont Park. Now let's move to the eighth. This is the true north. What makes this race fun is there's a return of a really interesting horse named Catalina Cruiser. Catalina Cruiser is the three. And he looked like one of the best older horses last year. The the problem is you you start looking back at, at him. He beat Battle of Midway, who's a nice animal. But other than that, he didn't we don't really know how good he is because the horses that he were crushing are just okay. He was your heavy favorite in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile Catalina Cruiser, and he finished sixth that day when City of Light was awesome. And then number City of Light came out of that race to win the Pegasus World Cup. Actually, the, the top two finishers came out of that race to finish one two in the Pegasus. So, you know, let's start, I guess, we're already talking about Catalina Cruiser. Let's start with him in the true north, and then we'll go back to the one and the two. He's in that Breeders' Cup. He's four deep. He's pressing. He looms up three deep on the outside. He got, you know, within about a half length. But he was all in. He fades. In the top two, City of Light seeking the soul, they come back and they run one, two in the Pegasus World Cup. We don't see John Sadler start a lot of horses in New York. He's had in the last five years, he's had just two starts in New York. Finishing fourth and eighth with those two runners. You go through every one of Catalina Cruiser's career races. His debut back in October. He was a little bit slow early, last early on, and he moved up gradually in between, angled around, visually very impressive. But what you notice if you go through each of his starts you know, he has good speed, even sprint speed, but he he's always a step slow. That worries me a little bit in this spot with a couple legitimate, very fast sprinters. I think he's the best horse. I think at the end of the year, he might be one of the, the top horses in the Breeders in any of the Breeders' Cup races. I guess take your pick, right? A horse like this could probably legitimately be in, I guess, any one of three if they wanted to. But you go through every one of his starts and he's just a, a little bit slow. Um, back on in, in May, May, you know, of of 2018, step slow, rushed up in between horses to lead. July the 21st, again a step slow, but shot through to lead easily. Dealt with minor pressure, you know, opens up. That's in the San Diego, crushed. August 25th, slowish start again, up to press, always within a length. So. In a sprint race like this off the bench, if he's a step slow, he might be in trouble winning the race. I think he's going to be really tough to keep out of your exotics. And he's training well. This is likely a starting point for him. So just remember that. You don't want to take too short a price on him because this isn't the goal. This is just starting point point A. And then let's get a race under him. And then this is a horse they'll they'll probably stretch back out. As you see, he ran well at Del Mar. Plenty of options at Del Mar. They go right back and run in the San Diego if they want. They go back and, you know, they can sprint, stretch back out, Pacific Classic, whatever they want to do. Let's go back to the inside with Bowen Raison. To me, it just seems a little bit overmatched in here, right? You look, he likes the trip. He's run well, but he was well defeated by recruiting ready and do share. And I don't even know if those are his two biggest worries in here. Stan the man. He broke on top, right on top last out. He had a three length lead at the top of the lane, but he quickly tired and, you know, he looked like he was done, but then he battled back. That's what I liked about Stan. It was just first start in a couple months. Now he cuts back to six and a half. The horse he finished in front of, Sunny Ridge, came out to win the grade three Salvatore Mile next out of the, the May 4th Westchester. And Stan has shown the ability to sit just off the pace. He might be able to work himself into a good trip here. I really don't have any knocks on Stan. I just, I I like others in here a little bit more. Wouldn't talk you off him. Hopefully he can just sit a little bit. And then through Catalina Cruiser, who, to be honest, I think he is the deserving favorite in here. Catalina Cruiser. Because he, his upside is just, the sky's the limit. And his best races are are much better than I think we've seen from any anyone, even you know a horse like Whitmore. 
Nicodemus, grade three winner last time out in the slop. He's been very good in the slop as of late. So I think he's a horse who you would upgrade if if it's wet weather. He was a step slow. He was up to press. He settled in third. He was about two, three lengths off. He was always in a good spot. He wore down Stan the Man and was able to to win that grade three. I feel the same though with Stan. No real knocks on them. Just the the top couple in here to me feel like they're on a different level. I think they're the top four. Pretty logical. I mean, you can make a case for even even maybe five, and I still think Stan the Man and, and Nicodemus are maybe a couple low them. Strike Power. Very interesting horse. His first couple starts uh, end of 2017 and early 2018 were very good. He was only, you know, he was under 4-1 to one in the Fountain of Youth. And he ran very well in the Fountain of Youth when he finished second behind Promises Fulfilled. And he was in front of Good Magic. And came back in the Florida Derby. He didn't want to go that far. But it, it's like that Fountain of Youth race, it almost took, it's like it zapped him. It took something out of him because he just was never the same horse again. Cut him back in a couple spots last year that seemed to make a lot of sense. The Woody Stevens, the Amsterdam, didn't run well there. Tried him on the grass, didn't run well there. So, you know, said, whatever's wrong, let's give him some time. Let's figure things out. And now he's come back as a four-year-old and in his first start, was very good. Guess where? At Gulfstream Park. He broke second best from the outside. Then he quickly got to the lead. He crossed over. Now the key is with strike power. He has to prove it away from Gulfstream Park. But his best races can absolutely win this race. And I think he's the fastest horse in the field. So strike power to me at 5-1 to one is the bet. He's 8-1 to one on the morning line. I don't think he'll be that high. I think if he's at, you know... I wouldn't want to go less than half of what he is. Five, if he's five, I'm making a win wager on him. You know, if he's nine to two, depending on what the rest of the the, the field looks like and how the track's playing, the races are playing, and everything. And but I, I think this is a good spot for Strike Power because it it's probably a starting spot for Catalina Cruiser. And Stan the Man is a little bit more route speed. Nicodemus isn't straight sprint speed. Recruiting ready. Is quick. I think strike power is a little quicker. Whitmore is going to have to come from off the pace, and so is Duchere. So I feel like this is a good race for strike power to try and steal on the front end. Question marks, but he should offer you value in in anything around five to one or over. Recruiting ready has become a, a pretty solid sprinter over the last couple years. He was a horse who I liked a lot early on in his career. He most recently finished second behind Frenzy Fire, who's going to be running in the grade one Met. He battled for the lead early on. He pressed just off. He moved to the lead at the top of the lane, but right as he moved to the lead, Frenzy Fire went right by. Recruiting ready, won the battle for second. He's now a grade three winner and a very, very solid sprinter. Wouldn't be a shock to see him right in the mix. I would be a little surprised to see him beat this group, though. I think Whitmore... Um, strike power with even Catalina Cruiser and Duchere. They all feel like they're a little bit, it's a little bit classier than recruiting Reddy, who was well defeated in this race last year behind Imperial Hand, but that was um, for a different barn. Whitmore. I was really disappointed with Whitmore in the Churchill Downs. I loved him that day. He looked like he was going to get a great setup on paper. And he broke outward. He was eighth, kind of ninth early on. He was seven off. He moved up to fourth. He was within three. He had dead aim. And he looked like he was going to blow by. And then he was just really flat late. He was behind Matoli, who he's been behind in his last two starts. I mean, we look at the horses who he's been behind. Matoli, Matoli, Roy H., Promises Fulfilled, Limousine Liberal. Not like he's been... Getting beat by nobodies. But I don't know. Five time graded stakes winner. Feels like it, it's more, or feels like it should be more, right? He was beating a neck in this race last year. I'm gonna put him third. Kind of have I really I have Whitmore and 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 Duchere like right next to each other. Duchere actually outfinished Whitmore most recently. He ran pretty well. Do share. He broke out a bit. It was not a great start. He settled towards the rear. 
10th of 11, 8 off, he moved to the 2 path, he was in between horses, he angled out widest of all at the top of the lane, he was one of the only horses that was really moving late, he outfinished Whitmore, and he always fires a late rally, if they go fast enough early on, he could win, that's the problem that I have, and that's why I have him even behind Whitmore, because I think Whitmore is a little more tactical, like Whitmore is a little more positional speed than Dushare, seems more of like a, let's take back and make one late rally, and if recruiting ready pushes strike power or and stand the man pushes them, then sure that that could happen. But I'm banking on strike power maybe sneaking away and, and that pace not being as quick. And it's a six and a half versus seven, where I think seven is a little bit not that Dushier can't win at six and a half, but seven just gives him a little bit more opportunity to do so. Five, three, seven, eight. I think Catalina Cruiser is a very nice animal and one to watch down the line, but strike power, this feels like it's it's a, a good spot for him. And the the seven and the eight are the two horses that are hoping to get the trips. Like I I don't want less than that seven to two on Whitmore. I really don't. He's been a little disappointing in some of his big spots. And and then Duchere. So if Duchere's double the price of Whitmore, then I'd prefer Duchere. But a lot of it's going to have to do with the rate, the way the race sets up. That's why Whitmore, you know, probably going to be a couple lengths in front of Dushare and at six and a half furlongs, that could be key. Let's move to race number nine. And this is going to be the last race I'm going to talk about because the, the tenth race, which is the Belmont <clears throat> Gold Cup Invitational, it's two miles on the grass. Just, it's not for me. I watched a lot of these replays. I looked at a lot of the horses in here. There are tons of opportunities on Friday and then tons of opportunities on Saturday. You're not going to be able to bet every race, and I just don't like the tenth race. There's a no, there's not enough sample size for me when I handicap races like this in the U.S. because there's there's not very many two mile races. Period. We see we don't even see a whole lot of mile and a half races. Period. Even on the grass. So I'm going to stay away from that race, and this will be the the last race that we talk about. Race number nine. It is the. The New York, the grade two. Not going to have to go far to find the horse that I like. And that's Holy Helena from the inside. She wants firm turf. If it's not firm turf, don't bet her to win. Plain and simple. She needs the, the turf to be firm. Now, we look at her recent form. And it's very easy to excuse some of the races. So if you see yielding turf, cross it out. If you see good turf. Cross it out. If you see firm turf, she runs well. Those are the races that we want to use as a sample for you know a race like this. So last out, she got bumped at the start a bit. She seemed intent on sitting much closer after being well out of it on the yielding in January at Gulfstream Park. So that's what I like is that I think they know that, okay, she's got to sit a little closer and that's when she's best is when... She doesn't have to be on the lead, but just two, three lengths out of it. That's when she has a, a an opportunity. She doesn't have to come from five, six, eight, ten lengths out. So she was third. She was tucked in at the rail. She was always traveling well, and she was always within two. She waited patiently for room. She got space at the top of the lane. She angled out, and she just got by Iki Masho. Iki Masho has run very well in her last three starts. Iki Masho, since that March race... Was second beaten ahead behind Santa Monica, then won the Grade Three B Witch, and then won the stakes at Pimlico on the undercard a couple weeks back. So, you know, Iki Masho, n- no shame in defeating that one who has come back to win and who win a couple races, Grade Three, and run very well. And then CKS Buena, that's a nice Argentinian bred who's two for three in the U.S. for motion. And so both wins, Holy Helena was right behind that one. I think she gets a great trip, saves all the ground in here. And, if, you know, you're trying to beat one of the, the other Chad Browns. This is the obvious horse. I think she's very, very live, very logical. And her A game could win this race. The two is Maddie's Magnum, who sat second under very slow fractions and then was done early. The only real trouble that this one has, which says check late, was when she was tiring and backing up. I do think that second start off the bench and putting two races together is you see she raced in September and then a couple months off, raced in November, then a couple months off, January, a couple months off, 
the fact that she's being able to put a couple races together should only help her in this spot, but I think she's way overmatched. Giant Zinger is the three. And she is an honest filly. I would not dismiss you using her underneath. She has some speed. She led the way early, but she was just no match for Santa Monica. Doesn't have to deal with Santa Monica today, who's defeated her in the last couple starts, but she does still have to deal with Semper Sentiente, who was in front of her and was, you know, four lengths in front of her. So I think just an under horse, but not not a complete dismiss because she at least has some some pace and she is, has that style where she'll probably be involved in the early running. Lady Montor, the four, she broke on top. She had the lead early, but then she decided to sit second when the zinger went out to the lead. She was always in a good spot, but when she asked, was asked to come challenge, she just had nothing, really nothing at all. I'm expecting her to be on the lead or or making an early move for the lead because she just does not seem like she really wants to be behind horses and come closing. Her best races have been right on the lead or sitting, making an early move to the lead. I think that's the best plan. And so if that is the case, I think the race will set up nicely for Holy Helena with you know the, the tracking sa- ground saving trip from the inside and maybe Holy Helena can get the jump on competition of ideas and even um, Home Reek, who maybe it's a little bit farther back. Vexatious is the five. I, I had Vexatious on a fantasy horse racing team last year. She's an interesting mare, right? Her In her career early on, she had, was running really well on the dirt. You'd see she raced. She faced Battle of Midway. She was behind the boys. She raced at fairgrounds and a couple graded stakes, multiple graded stakes raced, uh, multiple graded stakes placed mare. And then even last year, she got put up via DQ in a grade three. She was very competitive. One, she was going long on the turf. Out in Southern California, though, that's the difference. The Southern California depth in these turf divisions is not much. So you can go from you know, an allowance horse easily into the long distance turf divisions and, and hit the board and graded stakes, no problem. This is a, a a little bit different now, having to face some quality Chad Brown horses and some of these legitimate East Coast distance types. So I just think this is not the best spot for her. She may need a little bit of class relief out on the East. Competition of ideas is the six. She is a grade one winner. She Last out, I thought ran really well. She sat third on the inside. She was just two off. She was tucked in. She was waiting for room. But she stayed inside and she had to slow her momentum. And Homerique was able to to just roll home and rally and not have to stop the momentum. With a slightly different trip, she wins the race, competition of ideas. So that, you know, it, it's like you're looking at this race from just a betting standpoint, and the two Chad Brown horses are going to take all the money, and you, you don't want to use some the both of them. But how, how do you, you you can't really dismiss competition of ideas because I, I thought she had a tougher trip than Homerique did. She could turn the tables on Homerique. Let's move to Semper Sentiente. You know, I, I wouldn't talk you off her. She, if she's in the exotics, it would not surprise me. But she just feels like a cut below, same type of thing. Like I think she's a, like a, a cut below competition of ideas, Homerique, and... The top selection, Holy Helena, and she. You know, you look at the running line. She de- she defeated Competition of Ideas, but that was in a race that was not on the grass. That was in a, a race that was taken off the grass. Semper Sentiente had a good start. She was close up third. She got pushed back a little bit. She was fourth. She was maybe four lengths off. She was behind horses on the inside. She had to angle around while Santa Monica got a clear run and the jump on her, and she was a fine second. She never runs a bad race. I just don't know if she could win. Second, third, fourth, sure. I don't know if she's good enough to beat Homerique, who is now going to go second start off the bench. She hadn't raced since October of 2018. She came into the Chad Brown barn, and she came into the U.S. for the first time on May the 11th. Now Chad Brown, now Irad Ortiz Jr. know her better. She's been in the U.S. for longer. She's had more time to acclimate. She should only step forward off of that effort. And she was a grade three 
which was a grade three win. She was fifth of six early on. She was last chasing a very, very slow pace, you know, at one point. She's waiting patiently. She gets room at the top of the lane. She angles out and she quickly, just a quick turn of foot, goes from fifth to the lead. This is a nice animal, another nice one for Chad Brown. She is almost a multiple grade one group one winner. She was sec or she was third in a group one field of thirteen where she was beaten just a neck. And then she was third in a group one field of fifteen where she was beaten just a length. Very, very nice animal. And she's gonna be tough in here. So you you'll see it could be a little bit of a chalky and and you'll notice it's not gonna always be that way, but there are just a lot of quality quality horses that are, are going to be tough to dismiss, right? Like if you go to race number five, if Shalone wins, obviously would be no surprise. I like my big Italian friend in there. So we have two, three, four, two, three, four, and two, three and everything. My big Italian friend and Shalone. Remember, bet my big Italian friend if you can get, you know, eight to one or so, and then some exactas with Shalone. You go to the seventh race. Now with the scratch of Maven, Rookie Salsa, four left are going to take a lot of money. So it wouldn't shock you if either one of them wins. I think the Italian-American has an opportunity. And then if you're looking for a price, maybe Federale in there. So eight, one, four, five for me. Rookie Salsa at over five to two will be the bet. You go to race number eight. Would it be a surprise if Catalina Cruiser won at a, at a short price? Not at all. But... Take a little shot against him because maybe he's a, a tad bit short off the bench and he's shipping and he's coming to Belmont Park and maybe this isn't really the preferred distance. Go to the five, strike power. Win wager on strike power at five to one and we'll hook up strike power in the exotics with the uh, the three, seven, and the eight. Catalina Cruiser, Whitmore, and Dushare. Obviously the logical underneath horses there. And then to the ninth race, Holy Helena. Any price, you know, over three to one, I think I'll play Holy Helena to win. The eight and the six, you know, your your other logical horses, Home Reek and Competition of Ideas. Keep an eye on Competition of Ideas. She, if she floats up, she's another one. Like I could play her to win at four to one, but she's probably not going to be four to one. But if Holy Helena gets bet and everybody's betting Home Reek and then people forget about competition I have ideas, then sure. She she ran I th- I thought she might have even been a little bit better than Home Reek. So when I have it one eight six, it's just like it's a one six eight eight six. They're like six and eight are together, but a lot of it's based on price. So if competition of ideas is going to be the better price, then you know, maybe you upgrade and you use that one. Best of luck on Friday, folks. Remember, if you can. Get to iTunes, subscribe, leave a nice little comment, five-star rating for That's What G Said. Always want to hear from you on Twitter. It's me, Gino B. Follow along, send me your thoughts. Big on Facebook, Facebook Gino, slash Gino Bacola. And on Instagram, G Bacola. Try to get involved in the conversation. We'll be back very soon with Saturday Belmont full card analysis. Thanks, folks. Joey, take it away, my friend.